Hey guys, this is Doug with Fellowship of the Martyrs.com, Liberty, Missouri. Today is the 9th of Av in the Hebrew calendar. The sun just went down. It's technically not the 20th in the Gregorian calendar, but sundown. The day starts in the Hebrew calendar, so from sundown today until sundown. Tuesday is the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av, A-V. Look it up, hebcal.com. This is the tail end of the three weeks of awe that run from the 17th day of the month of Tammuz, which is the month right before this, to the ninth of Av. The 17th of Tammuz is the day that's commemorated as the day the walls were breached in Jerusalem after it had, they had laid siege to it for a long time. In the 9th of Av, both Solomon's temple and Herod's temple were destroyed. The 9th of Av is also the day, the day that the spies came out of the Promised Land with Moses and said, there's giants in the land, we can't go. They chickened out. God said, okay, you're all going to go in the desert and die. Some people think that the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they wandered around in the desert for 40 years before they went into the Promised Land. And that's not what happened. They came out of Egypt, made a beeline for the Promised Land, were there in a matter of weeks, even though they had millions of people and animals and everything, God fed them and everything all the way to the Promised Land. They sent 12 spies into the Promised Land. They came back and said, this is an amazing place, a land flowing with milk and honey, which is important because if you got honey, you got bees. If you got bees, you got pollination, you got lots of plants and flowers and crops. If you don't have bees, you're in big trouble, much like in America the bee population is dying all over the place and nobody knows why which is going to result in famine anyway they said it's a, a place flowing with milk and honey and they brought back a bunch of grapes so big one bunch that they had to carry it on a pole on their shoulder between two guys and they said truly this is a great land but there's giants the Anakim descendants of the Anunnaki and we are like grasshoppers before them. They have great walled cities and we've got no hope. And Ten out of the twelve spies said we're screwed. In Hebrew, whatever that word was. And two of them, Joshua and Caleb said, our God will give it to us, let's go. The people were swayed by the cowards. Were convinced that they should go back to Egypt. Wouldn't listen to Moses, wouldn't listen to Joshua and Caleb. And chickened out. So God said to Moses, okay, let's go. We're going into the desert. We're going to be 40 years before I give you another chance at this. Every grown-up, everyone that doesn't have faith like a child, everybody over 20 years old, except Joshua and Caleb, is going to die before you get another chance to go into the promised land. They're like, when they hear Moses tell them what God said, they're all like, oh, shoot, uh, yeah, we don't like that. We'll go. We'll go. Watch. We're going to get an army up. We're going to go right now and start taking over the land. Moses said, the Lord's spoken. It's too late. He's not with you. You're going to get your butts kicked. Don't go. And they go, get their butts kicked. And they go off in the desert. And even though he feeds them and protects them, they grumble and whine the whole time. Says their shoes don't wear out. Their animals don't miscarry. God provides manna every day, leads them with a pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. and They pick up and move around the desert for 40 years. It's not that big a space. It's not like they were lost. They were following God as he went around in circles, waiting for them to die, being patient until he could raise up a people that would obey, like he told Moses he would do. And then everybody that has faith like a child, 
Joshua's in his 80s by the time they get another chance. Moses doesn't get to go. Joshua takes Moses' staff, touches the Jordan. It parts just like the Red Sea did, and they cross over into the Promised Land and start crushing cities. The ninth of Av is a day they chickened out and had to be utterly destroyed for their cowardice. Various places in the New Testament talk about who's going into the lake of fire. Fornicators, adulterers, homosexuals, and the cowardly, the double-minded, the fearful. Well, God doesn't forget that stuff. So later on, when they get fearful again, don't obey God, obey the nations, commit idolatry, God destroys Solomon's temple, one of the seven wonders of the world, on the ninth of Av. They go into captivity, they come back, they rebuild it, they disobey again, go into captivity longer, get to come back, add on to it. Then in AD 70, they've rejected Jesus, spit on the Holy Spirit, grieve God again. So this time they go into captivity, spread out among the nations, lose their land for a couple thousand years. Herod's temple is destroyed on the 9th of Av. Kicked out of Spain in the 1400s, I believe, on the 9th of Av, lose everything. One disaster after another. Some say that Hitler signed the death warrant on the Jews on the 9th of Av. And now it is a day of fasting and mourning. And the three-week period between the 17th of Tammuz and the 19th of Av, and the 9th of Av is a, the three weeks of awe, where you just put your hand over your mouth, weep, and go, "Man, the Lord's big, and He's mad." I'm hearing well I did that video about the Psalms and the training program for the remnant and people really commented sweetly and sent me private messages and whatever and how much they enjoyed me just reading the Bible with passion and understanding and kind of explaining it along the way and so I intend to do more of that Today would be a good day to do the Book of Lamentations. Nobody likes the Book of Lamentations. But today is the Book of Lamentations. I expect to cry a lot. So, anyway, we'll get to that later, but uh, maybe in the morning. But uh, this, this prophetic time clock, timetable that the Lord is on, if you are led by the Holy Spirit, I expect that in the last three weeks you have been getting pounded on, in one way or another, getting pounded on. Oh, I can't even make a list of the nonsense and craziness around here. But it's escalating, <laughs> and I really want it to be over. Following the three weeks of awe are seven weeks of consolation leading up into the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles. And the rabbinical theory is that uh, it takes longer to get over somebody dying than for them to actually die. It takes longer to recover from an injury than to cause the injury. So in the three weeks God crushes us, and in the seven weeks, He restores us. And we're getting crushed. I don't know about you, but I'm getting crushed. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're unrighteous. In fact, like the ark in the Psalms that I talked about, over and over the remnant is going, you don't go out with our armies anymore, our enemies are all against us. 
We're pounded on every side. We're dust to be trampled under men's feet. And yet we didn't disobey. You would have known if we'd have worshipped other gods or gone our own way, but we didn't. For your glory, we are crushed on every side. Psalm 22, the Messianic Psalm. One of the Messianic Psalms. The whole Bible is Messianic. But Psalm 22 is real obviously about Jesus praying through David. I'm a worm and not a man. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. My bones are all out of joint. They cast lots for my clothes. Uh, you know, it's, it's all about being crucified. It pierced my hands and feet. There was no such thing as crucifixion in David's time. Why would he have even said that? Why He wasn't killing people that way. The Philistines weren't killing people that way. It, clearly, it's prophecy about how Jesus would die. And he was righteous. And yet, he was afflicted on every side, scorned, hated, lied about, spit on, like a lamb to the slaughter. For God's glory. This group of townhouses we have here, I'm asking the Lord if we got too many, did I commit to too much, did we hear wrong, because we're behind on everything. I mean, I'm a couple months back with landlords, utilities, the free store, we're four months back on the rent, the landlord showed us some grace, but... Um, we're planning on we had two different locations one where we have a food pantry the other where we have a pantry in the free store we're gonna to have to consolidate all of that into one location but separate them because we can't have the pantry in the free store but that's okay because that's gonna work out so put the clothes in one end of the building and the food at the other and different volunteers and whatever and it'll be fine but um, I've, I've done videos before uh, walking through the free store and showing you there and doing the food giveaways out front and that chapter is coming to an end because it takes about eighty dollars a day six days a week coming in to support that thing and would be lucky to get twenty in the jar never mind that you know two thousand people a month get fed out of there that people would walk out of there with 50 60 70 pounds worth of groceries legitimately there were some that really probably couldn't spare a dollar but most of them could have put five or ten bucks in the jar since they're getting a hundred dollars worth of groceries um, but I think the Lord wants to look to us we don't ask for donations for the food we just or the clothes we've got some transition there and volunteers people frustrated that with scared about the money problems and that's okay God's got it all timed out all the right folks will show up when the right time and see what the Lord's gonna do at the houses this is not a Christian community. This is not a monastery. We've got folks here that love Jesus with all their heart, more than anybody maybe I, I know any place. And we're sent here, have been have committed to be here to help. And we got people that were living under a bridge or, or just needed a place to stay and the boyfriend kicked them out and they're not sure how they feel about Jesus or they're outright hostile toward Jesus and think we're all crazy Christians and whatever. But um, they need a roof. Some folks say that I've bit off more than I can chew and we shouldn't uh, that we take too much abuse and too many people take advantage of us and we're enabling people and whatever and yet I think my job is to take in the poor wanderer and love them break the yokes of oppression do everything I can to free them and when the Lord wants them out of here, the Lord will get them out. I've seen him do it over and over and over. And it's been a lot more pure and a lot more holy than if I just started, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you're, uh, you're a drunk out. 
You, you're doing a marijuana, out. You, you're a hypocrite and a gossip, out. You know, where's that going to stop? How do you, how do you have a hospital where you eject all the sick people and all you got is doctors? As if I could find doctors that weren't at some point or another patients themselves or needed uh, a little uh, first aid. So, in the last couple weeks we got tires blowing out, vehicle problems, behind on the bills, landlords calling, utilities calling, my phone bill this morning they gave me another week to get it paid or else and I get calls from all over the world all the time people needing counseling people needing prayer people getting healed getting delivered people that have been to ministries all over been to a conference paid a hundred dollars a ticket to go to this big conference to get deliverance nothing happens but they call we pray they get free and I can't keep the phone on I mean the Lord did he they showed me mercy I got a week we've got 50 people in six townhouses that were housing feeding clothing transporting getting them to work they pitch in what they can a uh, food pantry and a free store feeding 3,000 people a month all of it on ten or twelve thousand dollars a month okay um, there's families making fifty sixty thousand dollars a year mom and dad and four kids can't survive on that we're talking hundred and twenty hundred forty thousand dollars a year to feed thousands to clothe hundreds maybe thousands to house fifty or more and people coming and going as there's a need and visitors coming from all over and operating the website and printing books and the whole shebang I think dollar for dollar uh, God must be multiplying it because I don't know know how it possibly could work and we'll get really behind and then God will move on somebody's heart and we'll get a check for 10,000 or 60,000 or 130,000 or some something And then, I, I mean, I'm staring down at a check for $60,000. And the Lord says, that's nothing. That's nothing like what's coming. Well, get about it, Lord. You know. Uh, two nights ago, I was up in the middle of the night because two of our residents... We're arguing about which set of speakers to use on the computer. One of them was drunk. He hit one, punched him, was probably going to punch him again. The other one at the computer stood up, punched him back, knocked him against the wall, cut his head open. He's bleeding. He is a uh, ex you know military vet guy post traumatic I don't know what alcoholic and he goes into combat mode so the first one's trying to cool everything down goes out to smoke a cigarette here comes one bleeding down his back bleeding down his neck with two knives out front in the parking lot <laughs> yelling and screaming and I'll show you and lots of you know expletives I'm upstairs sleeping I hear the commotion out front I can't see it out the window I get dressed go downstairs oh my gosh not again <clears throat> and uh, yelling and screaming is not altogether unusual anyway so he's out there with a couple of knives doesn't remember it later demons totally in charge anyway the one that was sober ends up stabbed four times in the chest and the neck twice in the arm oh and once five times and uh, by the time I get down out there they're both bleeding 
and both kind of shocked that it even happened. And all of a sudden, everybody's real apologetic and everybody's getting along. As soon as I start praying against the demons, it's like it all clears up and people get real sober real fast. One's gushing blood out his neck, out his chest. We don't even realize he's got another one in his arm until we get his shirt off. My shirt, which I loaned to him. <sighs> so I'm trying to do some first aid, clean him up. Praying along the way, praying for them, trying to get their cup full, weighing options. Do we call the cops? I mean, this is aggravated assault, attempted murder with a deadly weapon. What is this? What do we do? How am I going to justify keeping this guy in the house when he's this dangerous? And, uh, you know, neither one of them want me to call the cops. Neither one wants to go to the hospital. They're both manning up. I'm tough. It'll be okay. Well, I'm pretty sure the one's got internal bleeding. The other one might need staples on his head, concussion or something. And I got first aid training and everything, so one little cut on his arm, I super glue shut. The one on his neck is deep. The one on his chest is two and a half inches. The, the slit is two and a half inches, and I'm pretty sure it's three, four inches deep. Well, he's a very big guy who recently lost like 300 pounds, so it's kind of hard to tell if he's got any internal bleeding. Because, God bless you, but uh, he's kind of lumpy um, <laughs> already. So, uh, it, it's, it's, anyway. So, but we're praying. We're down there cleaning him up. Grabbing whatever first aid we stuff we have. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you're going to the hospital. Because... I'm pretty sure you're bleeding internally and he's got a one on his throat that closed up and stopped bleeding but he's tasting blood in his mouth okay that ain't good the other one's real apologetic all of a sudden he's getting Jesus-y just tell the truth I'll take the consequences I'll do the time whatever this is I can't believe I did this this is ridiculous and whatever so we run him over to the hospital. He's worse off than we thought. He actually has tasted blood because there's a hole all the way through into his throat. They go in with a laser, cauterize it. These two are deep enough, they don't want to stitch him up because they've got to heal themselves down deep and just change the bandage, keep them clean. The one on his, on his forearm is just like a paper cut, barely even broke the skin, no big deal there. It stopped bleeding instantly. The other one on his arm, I super glued shut. The uh, guys at the emergency room are like, what's this? He super glued it. Cool. Did a good job. Great. Wasn't very deep. Um, wasn't into muscle tissue. And uh, sealed it up quick. Stopped bleeding. They just left my super glue. And, uh, which is what super glue was invented for, by the way. It's, uh, it's, in research it, cyanoacrylate. Uh, <clears throat> used in Vietnam for field dressings uh, first. Anyway, so uh, so I'm up all night. Cops come. The hospital calls. I have to call because I know the hospital is going to call. And I cleaned them all up. I got the knives. I, I don't want to I don't want the cops to come and think oh you're hiding evidence. You're trying to cover something up. Whatever. And I'm not going to take a bullet, you know, a kid that's being abused needs a place to stay and hide out from whoever's abusing her, oh yeah, I'll take a bullet for you. Stupid drunk people, no, no, you're on your own. Anyway, religious persecution, hunted down for having a house church, oh yeah, I'll hide you, you know, whatever it takes, but, you know, as a pastor, whatever I am, uh... I got an obligation as far as confidentiality when it's a confession and whatever. So there's a certain sanctuary, but I ain't protecting stupid people. That anyway, and he was willing to face the whatever. So I call the cops. Hospital calls the cops. They interview the one at the hospital. Come back here. Take him into custody. 
find out he needs stitches, may have a concussion, needs a CAT scan, so they take him to the hospital and release him uh, on his own recognizance because if he's in custody and they take him to the hospital, they're responsible for the medical bill. <laughs> and they're so worried about liability, and if he got hurt in their custody or something went wrong or he passed out and didn't wake up or whatever, then they'd be liable and get sued. And So they just drop him off at the hospital. It doesn't matter if you stab somebody they're not going to be liable for your medical bills. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, I finally get to bed at 3.30. The cops leave. I brief everybody, go to bed. At 5.15, he's calling me from the hospital. Hey, can you come pick me up? Which is only like three miles away. But uh, I'm like, whoa, 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 what, what? Well, they just dropped me off. They want to do a CAT scan, but I told them to get stuff. You know, they stapled my head and released me. All right. So I'm going to go get him and bring him home. Of course, people are mad at him. People don't trust him. People are scared of him. I'm not scared of him. He's scared of me. You can ask him. Uh, this is a guy that was a bouncer in a pool hall when he was 13 in Detroit. Okay, I mean, anyway. But... Uh, I told, I've talked to him before about, you know, the Lord told me not to raise my hands in violence to anybody, even to defend myself. He says, I, I don't know how to talk. All I know how to do is hit people. And uh, I can't be a pacifist like you. Like, dude, I'm not a pacifist. Where'd you get that idea? Well, you said you're, you're against violence. <laughs> no, I just don't do violence the way you do. You know, in the spirit, I'm shredding ruthlessly torturing, waterboarding <laughs> any demon I can find that's messing with you and up in my face. And uh, I said, well, I don't, you know. I said, let me, let, let's check, okay. Has anybody ever in a fight hit you so hard that you cried? Has, has any man on earth ever made you cry in a fight? No. Have I ever made you cry? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> there you go, dude. I got weapons. Okay, you're right. You do. You just got to poke them in the heart real good. I don't care how tough they are. They'll go down. <laughs> hit their knees and cry like a baby. You hit them in the right heart. And just just right on the spot. Uh, anyway. I ain't scared of him. I ain't worried about getting stabbed. I ain't worried about him, whatever. And the end result is he's sworn off alcohol, period. After a year and a half of trying to get him, trying to talk to him, trying to convince him, trying to show him the consequences, dealing with all kinds of nonsense you wouldn't believe, far beyond any ministry I can think of anywhere, now he gets it, has received some prayer, sees his needfulness absolutely committed to stop drinking if he sticks to it God might honor it and somehow he might get some slack on this as it is he's not in custody went and talked to the police today they let him walk out of there and they'll decide what to charge him with and the other one may or may not testify against him doesn't really want to but the cops may pick it up anyway and it could be something little or it could be attempted murder with a deadly weapon 15 years plus I think it entirely depends on how much mercy the Lord is going to show him and how much he stands by what he said nonetheless the point of all of that was this kind of craziness is just one little tidbit of what my week has been like. I met today with the volunteers at the free store, the main ones that have been around a long time, just to talk about what we need to do. And the consensus is to shut it down. And uh, we prayed about it, and everybody's pretty much hearing that it, you know, makes a lot of sense. And I can see the value in letting the city know 
you know, this could have worked. Could have been great. Lots of good fruit. Lots of people prayed for. We had people come in suicidal, ready to kill themselves. Prayed for them. Got their cup full. Got their job back. Got their husband back. Got their house back. Got, you know, things getting restored. I mean, within hours. <clears throat> we had one lady who lives in her car, who had been living in her car for a while, sleeping at the free store because there's a shower there and the building's there anyway and she can officially, she's the night watchman, but if she were to fall asleep on the sofa, uh, it, it'd be okay because she's a volunteer, so what do I care? And I want to cry. I want to scream. I've been screaming. I've been crying all day. I've been hyperventilating from just the pressure in my chest, and the weight on my shoulders, and maybe this isn't the video for this. Maybe this isn't even going to go online. I don't know. Maybe he's having me store it for the Lamentations video. I'm sure there's somebody that'll say, what kind of ministry are you running there where you got knife fights out in the parking lot? <laughs> and I'd say, what kind of church have you got where everybody gets along all the time? How much love does that require if you've ejected everybody that's difficult? I got some folks here that everyone has ejected. Everyone there's nowhere else. If they can't find God here, I, I don't know. I don't know where. If they can't get loved here, I have no idea where to send them. I don't even know of anywhere that will put up with as much as I will. And love them through it and show them while they desperately try to push you away from them, put up walls, and get you to hate them so that ever, they can be justified in hating themselves. Not everybody. If you've ever watched the TV show MASH, you know it's a hospital. A and there's guys that go in there clutching a grenade in surgery trying to blow themselves and the doctors up or, or angry with the doctors because the doctor amputated their leg and even though he didn't have a choice and saved their life. And guys that leave furious because the doctors didn't do what they felt. I don't know. And I've had a lot of people leave here furious. So they didn't feel like they got the medical attention, the, the, the deliverance, they, they didn't get the whatever that they, they thought they needed. And yet we treated what the Lord would let us treat. And they, sometimes they didn't like the prescription and threw up and, you know, threw it all back. Man, I still want to cry, and I don't know why. He won't. Okay, well, that's all. Uh, please pray for us. If the Lord says to help, we could really use it right now. Um, I would really like to not just be another blip in church history, another guy that tried with all his heart, was spit on, rejected, afflicted, hated by the church, and didn't really get anywhere because nobody would help. I know God's with me. And then I know Hebrews 10 and 11, 10 or 11, whichever, talks about all those that walked in leather, eating locusts, living in caves, the world thinking they were afflicted and the world was not worthy of them. Now, I'm not saying my name should be inserted in the pantheon of heroes with Gideon and Jephthah and David and Samson and all those guys 
who were, by the way, substantially flawed. I don't know that I qualify to be on that list or ever will, but... Man, there's so many in history. The Lord raised up till the church killed him. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to be. So that he can pour out more judgment. Whack him again. Get it over with. Cut the day short. Fine. Whatever brings him the most glory. I appreciate your prayers. I know there's lots and lots of intercessors all over the world. Praying for us. Praying for liberty. Praying for my happiness. Or strength or peace or whatever. It's not a matter of losing my joy. It's not a matter of doubting God. It's not a matter of losing faith. I praise Him for the scar tissue. And I, I'm, I'm not unhappy <laughs> about having more stories to tell about how He delivers us, pays things at the last minute, puts it on the heart of the body to say the right thing or call and encourage me or I've been getting tons of private messages on YouTube lately just folks saying you made a difference to me you did make a difference to me you never heard of me never emailed you we didn't talk on the phone but I watched your videos and you made a difference to me and that's real sweet and there's some days Some days that's the thing that keeps me going, and that and him, and not letting me quit and everything. But I wonder why it's so hard. I mean, I understand the resistance and how much the enemy doesn't want some of the revelation, some of the things the Lord showed me about the church, about what it's supposed to be, about how to pour out repentance, about. I understand why the enemy is doing everything possible to stop those things getting out there. There's videos from Paul Washer that have got thousands and thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of views. And man, there's some videos that there's some stuff the Lord's poured out of me that's awesome. Like the video about the sword out of his mouth. Dude, I was shaking the whole time because the power of God was, it was not me. That was not me. The red dragon is so real, so biblical, so true. I don't care what anybody says. It's absolutely there. It's absolutely real. And it's absolutely taken over. And when you understand it, Forgiveness and mercy can flow where before you were bitter and angry about how the church hurt you and how pastors spit on you and whatever. When you understand it, repentance and mercy can flow. Anyway, uh, that's all for now. Thanks for listening. More at fellowshipofthemartyrs.com.